Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending today's webinar. This is Ben Kieser, and I am with Purple Mountain Technology Group, which, if you didn't know, is the sister company of Applied Flow Technology, which I am still also a part of. I get to wear two different hats. It's very exciting because with Applied Flow Technology, I get to put my hat on the support side, and then on the Purple Mountain Technology Group, front i get to put my hat on for the consulting side and so where is purple mountain technology group helpful well let's say that you have a flow analysis project that you need some help with and perhaps you may not have the time you're in a bind maybe your team doesn't have the current bandwidth um, maybe you just recently purchased the software but you haven't had a chance to really get trained on it yet, Pumper Mountain Technology Group can step in and save the day and help you with your projects. We are experts in all things related to flow analysis and pumping systems and, and gas piping systems, and so we can certainly assist with filling in that gap. Or maybe uh, you don't have time and you just, hey can you do the project for us purple mountain technology group not only is expert and very quick at building models for you but we can also analyze them properly as well and so that's who purple mountain technology group is we've been supporting aft customers for over 20 years and we have lots of expertise and so here is my contact information if anybody has questions on how we can help you with your projects by all means get in touch and we will be glad to help you and so that's who purple mountain technology group is and i'm excited to present a uh, case study that purple mountain did on a fuel oil fuel oil terminal system a number of years ago and so just one of the many cases on how we can assist you. Okay, uh, this webinar is being recorded. I have provided a PDF of the presentation if you are listening in live. If you are listening to the recording of the webinar and you would like a copy of the presentation, then please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to send it to you. And you can again find my contact information here in the lower left corner. Also, please be sure to like us on LinkedIn. And so we've got a good page here on LinkedIn sharing some various blog articles and resources and uh, just getting to be active on there. So please like us on LinkedIn and we'll be glad to communicate with you. All right. Let's get down to business. So what are we talking about today? Um, a number of years ago, PMTG did a surge analysis project for a fuel, fuel oil terminal expansion. And so the goal of that project was to size and locate several sets of surge relief valves. So uh, SRV, I've denoted the acronym as a surge relief valve. And you can see that there are several sets of surge relief valves. Maybe I should do a different color. Uh, several sets of surge relief valves throughout the system. It's a, a really large piping network, uh, probably uh, about 10 to 20 kilometers worth of total piping. And we've got to make sure that we protect the system. Another goal was to determine automatic logic for pump trips and valve closures. Now, a couple of things here. I have given you links to two things. The project abstract is a very basic high level two page executive summary of what the project was and what it accomplished. And then if you want more detail, we also have a link to the project paper which was presented at the Pressure Surges Conference in France back
back in 2018. And so that will give you a lot more detail in depth into the various cases that we looked at within the project. So this was the piping system that we were dealing with. So with the initial evaluations, uh, recommendations that were made uh, for the surge relief valves satisfied the pressure limits in the majority of cases. Now, some of the cases, pressures will, were still exceeding the uh, maximum allowable surge pressures, and that was certainly a problem. So we had to try some other approaches uh, in those situations. And one of the things that was attempted was slower valve closures. And so we looked at using slower valve closure rates and found that those slower closures were not helping to protect the system from overpressurization. So the first question is, shouldn't a slower valve closure help reduce the pressure surge that you'd be seeing in the system? Well, sometimes um, it really depends. And let's take a look at uh, what's going on with that here. So let's take a gate valve, for example, because a gate valve is one of the uh, valves that was in that piping system that was closing to cut off flow from the uh, fuel oil transfer process. So let's take a situation where we are doing a linear uh, valve closure on an open percentage basis. So we're essentially going from 100% open to 0% open in either 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So this is the linear closure that we're talking about. 30 seconds here, 60 seconds here. You can see what the resulting CV versus time profile looks like. So the CV gives you a representation of kind of the change in flow through the valve over time. So the question is, does doubling the valve closure time help reduce surge pressure? Well, in this case, it does not. When you look at the pressure at the inlet of the valves, the pressure here for the 30 second closure is just slightly higher than the 60 second closure. Why is that? It's because with a gate valve, there's not very much control of flow going on. And so during the whole time frame, while the valve is closing, you can see that we still have a very significant amount of flow through the gate valve. It's not until the very last few open percentages of closure that we see a steep drop off in flow. So if I go back to the previous slide here, we're doing a whole bunch of valve closure processes and nothing happens with the flow rate until the last few percentages of open that we have for the valve. That's when everything starts to shut off finally in terms of flow. And that's also why we see such a large spike in pressure because it's a very sudden stoppage of flow. So in this particular case, simply doing a longer closure virtually makes no impact on the system pressure and flow. We're still gonna have the same surge problems. And this is what we were seeing in the fuel oil terminal system. Now, just to take this one step further, what if we compared a gate valve with a globe valve, two different types of valves? Well, if we're looking at two different types of valves and we're comparing a 30 second closure with a 60 second closure, we wanna look at what the response and pressure and flow looks like in that case. <clears throat> now you can see here that for the open percentage, the lines are on top of each other. So, this line here represents a 30 second closure for both the gate valve and the globe valve. And then here we have 
a 60 second closure for the gate valve and the globe valve. But look at the massive difference in CV profiles. So with the CV versus time, you can see how we have a very steep drop off in CV for the gate valve. The globe valve is much more gentle on its closure. Now, even though they are different CV values, we still have the same initial pressure and flow rate. So even though they're different CV values, it's still starting off with the same initial conditions for pressure and flow. But look at this. For the gate valve, here's our initial surge pressure, 400 PSI compared to about 750 PSI. If we double the closure time, it takes it from about 400 down to about 250. So we do have a decent drop in pressure for the globe valve compared to the gate valve. We also have a uh, <clears throat> better control mechanism with the changing flow versus time. So that is a situation where closing a valve over a longer period of time actually does help. So the moral of the story here is not just closing valves over longer periods of time. It also depends on what kind of valves you're dealing with and the system that they're installed in. You could also have situations where maybe you are using a globe valve, but based upon the type of system that it's installed in, maybe that doesn't give you very much savings on pressure surge by closing it longer. So the key thing is that it depends on many factors, not just the amount of time it takes to close the valve. All right. Give me one second here. Okay. So this is what the first resolution was for the project. Um, there is a, uh, a reference out there uh, by Swafield and Boldy called Pressure Surges and Pipe and Duct Systems. And in that reference, they put out this 80-20 rule for valve closures where if you are closing the valve in a period of time, let's say around 150 seconds, rather than closing it linearly from uh, open to close, it's better to close it really quickly in the initial 20% of the time frame. So that's what we're doing here. We're closing the valve 80% of the way within the first 20% of closure time. So uh, that's about uh, 30 seconds. So here we're closing the valve 80% of the way within 30 seconds. And then over the remaining time period, we're closing the rest of the 20% of the CV. So obviously that is an ideal situation that it would be good to do. And you may not be able to exactly close your valves over a 80%, 20% profile. That's okay, maybe you get close, maybe 70, 30, 60, 40, uh, 85, 15, whatever. Uh, the thing is here, if you look at this standard gate valve closure, the orange dotted line, <coughs> this looks just like it did in the previous slides that I was demonstrating where closing it over a longer period of time does not help. And if you remember the flow versus time that resulted, the flow did not change at all until the very last moment. So the standard gate valve closure is something that we want to try and avoid if we can. Now this dual rate closure is where we kind of have the, the best of both worlds. We have where it's closing really quickly and then over the rest of the period, it does it in a slower fashion. And so simply by getting a different uh, or a, a dual rate valve actuator, 
can really help the situation. The question is, does it? Well, in this particular case, it does. So here we have our maximum allowable surge pressure, and we want to make sure that we're not exceeding that. And we look at several cases. Here's a 60 second valve closure. That's the initial attempt. And it is way above the maximum allowable surge pressure in that case. So we try what we did before, but we, instead of doubling it, we, you know, went almost one and a half times longer. So here, this is a 160 second linear valve closure. And as you can see, same problem. It's because even though we're closing over a longer period of time, nothing happens until that very last little bit. Now, when you apply a dual rate closure for the 160 second uh, time frame, this does a magnificent job of not only getting the pressures below the maximum allowables, but significantly below. So, you don't always need expensive surge suppression equipment. Simply changing the way that your system operating, the way your system operates, can be the best thing to do. Uh, perhaps you might have the flexibility to lower the initial steady state velocity, maybe operating at lower flow rates, perhaps, or uh, maybe making some of your pipe diameters a little bit larger. That can help reduce some of those pressure surges. And here, a good case in point is using a dual rate actuator rather than a whole bunch of relief valves. So <clears throat> the final recommendations for this system, they went back and reevaluated the entire system with using dual rate closures on all the valves. And this eliminated all but two sets of relief valves where each set cost about $250,000, one and a quarter million dollars in total savings. So simply by changing the way that it closed. So uh, just goes to show that this is a really effective method of surge suppression. Now, how does this look like in action? How would you actually do this type of analysis? Well, I'm gonna go over a basic example now and I'm gonna jump into AFT impulse, and I'm modeling a ammonia transfer system. Why am I modeling ammonia instead of fuel oil like in the fuel oil terminal? Well, <laughs> it's a little bit more exciting because ammonia has a really high vapor pressure and it's likely to cavitate. So uh, the goal here is I've got two requirements. A, I need to figure out a closure time frame where there's no cavitation in the system. And then B, I also need to ensure that pressures are within 200 to 300 PSI. So those are my two requirements that I have. All right. So here's my piping system. And I have a reservoir where it's representing the uh, ship tank where it's pressurized at 250 psig <clears throat> and we are discharging to the onshore holding tank also at 250 psig so we do have some elevation differences uh between the tanks so that's what's driving our flow we have a uh, eight inch diameter pipe coming off of the ship, 100 feet long, and then we have a couple of 10-inch diameter pipes, 300 feet, and this one here is 150 feet. So this is just simple iteration on valve closure timeframes. Now, this could represent a situation where you don't have that much information. So here, I don't have a open percent versus CV table that I can use from a valve manufacturer yet. That data doesn't exist for me right now. 
So I can't do a linear closure in terms of the open percent versus time. So <clears throat> I'm going to start off with the assumption of closing the valve linearly within half a second. So I'm going from 1,000 CV down to zero in 0 0.5 seconds. And then I'm going to try two other closure rates, a one second closure. So here you can see where I'm using a one second closure and then a two second closure. So those are my three scenarios that I'm going to attempt to model with changing the amount of time it takes for the valve to close. All right. Well, let's take a look here at the half a second closure case, and let's see what the pressure of the valve looks like. So if you're not familiar with uh, impulse, here's something that's really cool that you can do. You can select that valve on the workspace and then right click and say, give me a transient graph for either the junctions. If you had open percent versus CV data, and you specified open percent versus time, you could plot that or you could plot the resulting CV versus time. Those are things that you can do. Or I can also plot the uh, these parameters for the connected pipes to that valve. So let's look at the pressure at the valve inlet and outlet versus time. So, <laughs> Here's what we have for the half a second closure case. All right, I'm only looking at the inlet of the valve right now. And as you can see, we have a really high pressure spike and then it drops down to vapor pressure. And then we start to see higher pressure spikes due to cavitation. So this is violating our first requirement. Now, how can we be absolutely sure that it's violating our requirement? How do we know that we're cavitating? Well, if I create another graph for the uh, maximum vapor volume as a function of flow path, these are how large the vapor bubbles get to be throughout the pipeline. So uh, the largest here gets to be about 0 0.06 cubic feet. Now, Maybe this is not very large of a vapor volume. Maybe this doesn't cause as many significant problems in your system. But again, we're still, we are cavitating. And as you can see, that cavitation will produce some fairly chaotic results. And it'll take quite a while for those high pressure waves to dampen out throughout the time frame that we're looking at and you're seeing pressure swings from 145 PSIA. This is just very slightly above vapor pressure up to 410 PSIA. So <clears throat> not only are we cavitating, but we're still exceeding the 200 to 300 PSI requirements. Now really quick, I created what's called design alerts. So design alerts are really useful because they are how you can set up your maximum and minimum limits for various parameters. So I've got three of them, a 200 PSI A, 300 PSI A, minimum and maximum pressure requirement, and then vapor pressure. So what's neat is on this plot here, I can cross plot this with my design alerts. And here we can see that we've got some significant problems. So that's something that is helpful is to create design alerts. You can very clearly see where you are exceeding those limits. Now, let's just take a look at vapor pressures alone for each scenario. <coughs> Because if I'm cavitating in any of the scenarios, then immediately I know that that closure time frame is not going to work. So this is a capability that came out in, uh, I think, Impulse uh, 9, maybe, maybe Impulse 8. 
is the multi-scenario graphing capability. And so you can plot multiple scenarios at the same time. So here is my vapor volume for the scenario of a half a second valve closure. If I want to look at the same thing, but for the other two scenarios, I simply click on this multi-scenario drop-down menu, <clears throat> click on select scenarios, and I can choose the other scenarios I want to review. And this makes it really easy to look at multiple scenarios at the same time. So we can see here that if I plot these one at a time, I've got non-zero vapor volumes for the half a second closure and the one second closure. Now, the two second closure, I don't have any cavitation going on. Well, do I? Well, <clears throat> let's look at that scenario really quick. I'm gonna jump to the two second closure scenario. And what you might be tempted to do is to look at the vapor volume column, which is good to look at. So if I scroll over, here's my vapor volume column. Look at this. You've got non-zero values, but they are 10 to the minus seven. So even though they're not actually zero, those vapor volumes are very, very small. Why is that when I am cavitating, or you know, why is it that I still have non-zero values? Well, it's because of the cavitation model that I'm using. I'm using the discrete gas cavity model, which is a better and more accurate cavitation model that does a really good job at smoothing out the <clears throat> chaotic behavior when you have cavitation going on. If I was using this discrete vapor cavity model, pressure would be fixed at vapor pressure when you start to cavitate, and uh, then you'd see larger vapor volumes. When you're using the discrete gas cavity model, the theory is you're always cavitating just a teeny little bit. Uh, that void fraction though is very, very small, however. So this allows just a better tracking of cavitation. I'm not gonna go into all the detail about it, but it is a better cavitation model. That's why it's not completely zero. But for our purposes, when we compare the three scenarios to each other, essentially the vapor volume is effectively zero no cavitation for the two second closure <clears throat> so we know that we're going to have to go with the two second closure for our system but let's take a look at a animation of the pressure for this flow path i'm just going to look at the current scenario now so I'm gonna click on output and I'm gonna cross plot my design alerts, change this to pressure. Okay, now I wanna give you a little tip. There are two different ways that you can do an animation. You can use the output file or you can use the solver. I don't like using the solver option Here's why. If I use the solver option and I click play, when results start to go crazy, I can pause it, but I cannot back up time steps, which means that I can only go forward in time. I can't go backward in time. <clears throat> On the other hand, if I use the output file, and I press play. Once things start to get chaotic, I might want to pause the animation and then back up time steps. See how I can now move backwards in time? This allows me to uh, go back to right before things go crazy and I can go back time steps 
and then move forward again one time step at a time. So what do you need to do to ensure that you can use the output option? You have to make sure that all of the interior computation stations for the pipes are saved to the output file when you do your transient run. That is set up in the analysis setup window. So when you go to analysis setup, and then <coughs> under pipe sectioning, here you can see that we are, uh, what kind of sectioning that we're using. And when we look at the output for the pipe stations, I'm saving all the stations. This is where you need to ensure that all of the stations that you want to include in the output file are included. So the easiest way to do this, uh, when you first run impulse by default, it's only going to be inlet and outlet. So when you first start using impulse, it's going to look like this. You're going to see inlet and outlet only. So if you just keep it inlet and outlet only, you are not going to be able to use the output fi uh, file option for the animations. So that puts a little hitch in your get along there. <laughs> so how do you fix that? Click the all button to check the boxes for all the rows for the pipes, and then change this drop down menu to all stations. <coughs> change all the selected pipes to all stations and there you go now doing this does contribute to a little bit of a larger output file size and runtime but i would rather deal with that with the ability to use the output file option on the front end rather than using the solver option which does not give you that much benefit so Make sure you're saving all stations. It'll make it a lot easier to animate your results. All right. So I've got my animation ready and I have my design alerts for the minimum and maximum pressures. And I am going to click the play button and let's see what happens here. So I click play. Oh man, if I, if I back up a little bit, when you do default speed, let's try this again. So when that valve closes in two seconds, this is still sending a significant pressure wave into our system. So this is exceeding our design alert all throughout that pipeline. So it goes well above 300 for many, many time steps. And then it goes below 200. And it continues oscillating for a while. So this is violating both of my design requirements. <clears throat> the surges are still way too much. So what I need to do is I need to try and see if there's something else I can do to help dampen out these surge problems of high and low surge in the system. Well, Let's try the 80-20 rule for the two-second closure time frame. So I'm going to create a new scenario, 80-20 closure. I'll call it dual rate closure. There we go. All right. So I've got my 80-20 dual rate closure. <clears throat> I'm going to open up my valve. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set the third data point to zero. All right, so what is 20 What is 20% of two seconds? That's 0 0.4. All right, so that's 20% of the time frame that it takes to close the valve. What is 80 per, or what is, uh, so 80% closure would be 20% of the initial CV value so this is 200. So as you can see, I'm closing the valve by a CV of 800 really quickly. And then I'm closing it the rest of the way a lot more gradually. 
And we're going to see if this dual rate closure mechanism helps mitigate surge. Let's see if we can get between our design alerts. So let's give that a try. All right, we'll run our model. And let's just go straight to the graph results. Now, this is telling me that I have some cautions that exist as well as some design alerts. So if I go back to my design alert tab in the output window, it is telling me that our maximum design alert is above 300 PSIA. Now, I need to add static pressure to my maximum output. So let me add that in here real quick. All right, so I've got static pressure as well as stagnation. So one of the things about the design alerts is not only does it tell you when it's being violated, it also highlights the violation in the output table, which is really helpful. <coughs> so we are still exceeding the design alert of 300 PSIA in pipe two with our 8020 rule but the question is for how long does that pressure stay at that level and how far throughout the system do i have pressures above 300 psia well this just goes to show looking at the maximum and minimum table is not enough we have to always dig deeper you got to do your graphs so let's go ahead and regenerate our pressure profile. All right. So I've got my design alerts. Everything's all set up. Let's go ahead and change the scaling a little bit. Let's uh, make this 25. Just get a little bit better resolution there. And let's go ahead and click on the play button. See what happens. All right. <clears throat> so the valve starts to close, and we're going to be able to see how high this first pressure spike gets. So let's continue to play it. And so this is where it's just getting to be slightly above 300. So you can see we have about 150, almost 200 feet of piping that is exceeding our design alert of 300 PSIA, but once that wave reflects, it's staying below that maximum. Now the valve is not completely closed yet. It's still closing gradually. And now is when we have our full closure. So here, when I just let this run, look at that. That is a very, very uh, light amount of surge. And you can clearly see how the dual rate method does a very effective job of helping to eliminate that surge. So let's look at the pressure of the valve again for all the cases. So. If I go back to the valve and select it, let's take a look at the pressure at the valve. I'm only going to look at the valve inlet. And let's take a look at all the other scenarios as well. Okay. Now this is a lot of data to digest, so it's nice to be able to turn things off and then look at the data one piece at a time. So here's our half second closure at the valve. So we are exceeding uh, 600 PSIA, that's twice our design alert pressure of 300. So definitely not good. If we do a one second closure, we can see how the initial surge pressure on closure has been reduced. So we're at 
our first uh, valve closure was at uh, 520. Now it's down to 475. This is something that's important to pay attention to. When you are cavitating, you might be doing the Joukowsky equation to calculate what your maximum theoretical pressure surge is to get this value. Well, look at this. That is higher than that value. So this is definitely a good case uh, to mention where simply doing a Joukowsky hand calculation is not enough. You can actually have higher pressure spikes, potentially significantly higher pressure spikes when you are cavitating. This is like balloons popping inside of the piping, not good. But you can see here for both the half second and one second case, the cavitation causes higher pressure spikes after the valve is closed. Look at that. Here's our initial pressure spike for Joukowsky, and you've got three big spikes that are still above that. When I bring this down to a two second closure, it does much better, but we're still above our 300 PSIA maximum, and we're still below our 200 PSIA minimum. And then when we do the 80-20 rule, it dampens out much more nicely. So here's two second closure, and then just the 80-20 rule. So simply closing the way that your or the way that you close your valve is just as not if not more important and more effective than how long it takes your valve to close and so keep that in mind when you're trying to determine your process conditions now i want to point out that you know this is a really complicated system okay there's piping all over the place and with all that complexity uh one second there are several operating scenarios to be considered uh sometimes you might have flow going from the ship to the onshore tanks you might have a situation where flow is going from the onshore tanks to the ship you might have a situation where flow is coming from the inland pipes and maybe it's going to both the ship docks or the uh, tanks or one or the other. There are several different operating situations that you can have. And here's the challenge is that you're trying to figure out surge mitigation methods with putting surge relief valves in they may help with one scenario, but with other scenarios, they might be more problematic. So if you're looking at a particular scenario and you figure out what the maximum and minimum pressures are, and then you put in some surge mitigation method, whether it's a relief valve or a gas accumulator or a vacuum breaker valve or an air valve, it might help with that particular scenario but then once you go to a scenario where now your your ships are unloading flow into the collection tanks well flow is then going backwards and maybe that causes more problems and then these expensive surge devices that you have sized and located maybe they don't work in the other scenarios or maybe they cause more problems. Maybe they cause uh, relief valve chatter, or maybe your surge vessels are not big enough uh, to accommodate surge. So it's really, really important to evaluate all of the scenarios carefully. For this particular system, there was you know a good few hundred scenarios that were very carefully evaluated and it's an iterative process you start off with maybe doing no surge suppression equipment <clears throat> just see what happens and start getting a feel for what the transients look like in your system 
similar to this situation here where I'm not doing any surge suppression equipment. All I'm doing is looking at different closure rates. And then once you do that, maybe you start to try, okay, well, if this one eliminates cavitation, let's see if doing an 80-20 rule helps. And then maybe you start to have to do surge mitigation. Key thing is, you got to make sure that you evaluate everything carefully. Just doing one or two scenarios is not enough. When it comes to safety, there are several scenarios that you need to look at. Pump trips, valve closures. How do those transients impact other transients? So if you've got a valve closure and then you have a relief device somewhere, well, whenever that relief device opens and closes, it's going to cause secondary transients in your system. So if your relief valve is not sized properly and it pops open and it relieves pressure way too well, then that relief valve is going to slam shut. When that relief valve slams shut, that's going to cause big pressure waves in the system as well. So <laughs> the device isn't actually helping you. So uh, just things to keep in mind when you're doing the analysis yourself. I always talk about how water hammer analysis is very much a black art. <laughs> Steady state modeling is fairly straightforward. <clears throat> Most have a good understanding of steady state situations and how things should function. But when it goes into water hammer world, things get very, very dicey very quickly. My recommendation is that if you're going to use AFT impulse, sorry, if you're gonna use AFT impulse, then make sure that you have quality training on not only water hammer theory, but on how to use AFT impulse effectively. Because if you don't know how to use it right, it's very easy to misuse a tool that is intended to help you be a little bit more efficient, okay? If you don't have that opportunity to attend a AFT Impulse training seminar, our next AFT Impulse training seminars are coming up in uh, October here of 2023. <clears throat> so... You know, it doesn't help when training is three months away and your project is now. So, again, this is where Purple Mountain Technology Group can always be a very good complement to what you're trying to accomplish. So, if that's the situation that you're in where you have a project that needs something to be done right away and you don't have the time or maybe the resources to get properly trained, especially on something like water hammer analysis with AFT impulse, then by all means, contact us at PMTG and we'll be glad to help. So here's my contact information. Uh, you can again find us on LinkedIn, just search Purple Mountain Technology Group. And then also our website is pmtechgroup.com. And this is where you can be able to contact us as well. We have lots of experience, all sorts of industries, oil and gas, power generation. You can see our vast level of experience in uh, cooling tower systems and, and whatnot. There's a wide variety of services that we can help you with. So we'll be glad to help you and we're always there for you. All right, <clears throat> that's what I have for today. Thank you all very much for listening in. I appreciate your time and hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of your week and take care.